Well, thank you, everybody, very much for coming uh, this evening. I know everyone's very busy, and it's a busy time of the term. Um, I wanted to give this talk, as much as anything, to thank everyone at King's College for their hospitality and kindness. Um, it's been an interesting two months. It's also been a time when I learned once again, I never do what I plan to do, and I end up doing slightly different things. And what I want to do today is both retrospective and prospective in the sense that I want to think about the career of an anthropologist in terms of the writing, in terms of how one's writing perhaps might change. Um, I think my early writings are probably best described as rather constipated um, in the sense that when one begins one's career, one is always very attentive to the idea that one should dot one's theoretical I's as well as crossing one's ethnographic T's. And I still believe in crossing the ethnographic T's. I think that the ethnography is always the heart of good anthropological writing. I'm less convinced that it's necessary to say all the time what you're doing theoretically. And the reason for that is not only that you can assume some knowledge on the part of your audience, perhaps less, perhaps more so, when you're not writing only for anthropologists, but also because I think anthropological writing occupies a unique position between art and science. On the scientific side, yes, you are expected to come up with some uh, factual material. And on the artistic side, uh, you're using a lot of metaphor because you couldn't possibly write, for example, a complete ethnography or anything that might uh, uh, seem to be a complete ethnography uh, unless you took a certain amount of poetic license and allowed your reader gave your reader credit for some intelligence for one thing, and allowed your reader to reconstruct certain things for yourself, for, for himself or herself. But when you do that, of course, you also don't really know what the reader is getting. So I want to think about different ways of writing. And I would begin by saying that I see myself as a realist. Now, to be a realist doesn't mean to be an objectivist. It doesn't mean to be a positivist. Quite the opposite. I don't think positivists are realistic. They think that you can somehow <laughs> capture everything and write it down precisely. And the more you reduce it to numerological mumbo jumbo, the more people will be convinced you've got it all. Uh, I actually think that that is self-delusion. As those of you who heard me in this very room last year know, I consider myself to be very much of a Vikian, and Vico surely was the philosopher par excellence who made us understand that our knowledge does correspond to something in the real world, in the phenomenal world, but since it passes through our imperfect understanding, our imperfect brains and our imperfect bodies, it's always going to be partial, and it's always going to be in some ways a very selective attempt at representation. So everything that we do is about facts, but facts themselves are representations. This, of course, is a very annoying position to take because it means that you are not going to be making the positivists happy, but the postmodernists of the more extreme variety are also going to be quite unhappy. Um, and I do take issue with people who uh, say that they're against realist anthropology because if we didn't think that there were real people out there with real problems and problems that they experience as very immediate, what would the point be of doing anthropology in the first place? Some of you may be wondering what the point of anthropology is anyway, but I think there are enough people here who would join me in saying uh, that it's, it's, um, it's a worthwhile venture. And in fact, having fought as an undergraduate very hard and unsuccessfully the right, for the right to read social anthropology, I'm very glad to be back at this university uh, in a situation where I really, in a sense, am reaffirming my faith in that discipline. Not that it ever really wavered. I can't imagine being anything other than an anthropologist. But um, these two months have given me a chance to reflect on what I've been doing and one of the results of that reflection is a very strong conviction that somebody needs to make the case for realism as such. Now, having said that, I then, of course, again with Vico, say, but everything we talk about is a metaphor, so, or is represented metaphorically, so why not use a metaphor that works for us? And for me, the metaphor that works best to describe my writing, at any rate, is sculpture. 
Why sculpture? Because you're shaping something. But more than that, you have to deal with the fact that some of your material is very precise and indeed could perhaps be represented numerically. In any case, it can be described in minute detail. And some of it is necessarily very vague, either because people wouldn't tell you things or you didn't have access or you simply don't really know after a year exactly what it was you were looking at in that particular context. And so I think that just as a sculptor will shape a piece of art in such a way that some things will be highlighted and others not, so the anthropologist shapes the narrative, shapes the account, so that you can actually see what that anthropologist thinks can be represented in a detailed way and what can't. <coughs> Now, some of the reasons why anthropologists can represent things in a detailed way have to do with competences they acquire beforehand. Obviously, language is crucial, and I've said repeatedly, and I've said to a number of people here, the only basis for taking an interpreter with you in the field is when you know the language well enough to know what the interpreter is not telling you, because then you find out what the cultural secrets are. <laughs> My... Uh, supervisor at Oxford, John Campbell, used to say that anthropologists were cultural spies, but please don't tell that to any governments we might have to deal with. <laughs> they wouldn't like it very much. <coughs> um, but there certainly is a sense in which um, access, either because you know the language well or because you let the people teach you, which is what happened to me in Crete. I had to learn the local dialect before anyone would talk to me about stealing sheep, since you couldn't really discuss it in the language of the police without uh, it's sounding very artificial. Or um, in some cases where there are multiple languages and one learns some better than others perhaps, um, the, the actual process of moving among the languages gives one a sense that some things are clearer than others. And that's okay. It's perfectly okay to be vague when the information one has is vague. In fact, it's more realistic. It's more honest. <coughs> now one concept for which there is a newly invented word that I absolutely detested when I first heard it, is the notion of positionality. And I tried to think of it, whether there might be another word we could use instead of that, but it actually says something that you could say very well, for example, in Italian, which is a language that revels in abstractions. So one can talk about, for example, projectuality, factuality, and so on, in ways that would be impossible in English. Positionality is a word we need because we need something that will tie down more precisely than the word ref reflexivity does it, what it is that we actually need to know about ourselves in order to give our readers a sense of how to interpret the data we present. The fact, for example, that um, I happen to like Thai food would probably be very irrelevant if I was writing about Rome. Um, but the fact that um, I have a secular Jewish background becomes extraordinarily relevant when I'm trying to deal with the way that the Romans see themselves as, in some ways, a Jewish city, strangely enough, even though the Jews are a very small minority. And trying to pull out that curious history means I have to say something about why it interests me as well. Otherwise, it's not going to make much sense to the audience. So positionality in that sense is a useful term, and it also reminds us that we're not talking about a position. We shift all the time in relation to the people we study, in relation again to the language we happen to be speaking, and in relation to the context in which that encounter takes place. Now, for me, there are also defining moments in the trajectory of a life. And I want to talk for a few moments about something that happened to me when I was 14 years old. And again, a few of you know about this. Um, it actually came a bit to a climax the other day here at King's College, and I'll tell you about that. Um, but it's simply that when I was 14 years old, my parents took me on a driving tour in Italy. And those of you who know anything about Weimar, German, German Jewish culture, especially Berlin, will know that uh, people with that background regarded Italy as one of the great places of high culture. And my parents were also opera aficionados. So when we got to Florence, there were notices everywhere saying that Ettore Bastianini, probably the greatest Verdi baritone ever, was performing in the title role of Nabucco. Now, my parents knew the chorus of Nabucco. 
uh, which uh, is the chorus of the Hebrew slaves as they're awaiting um, either further exile or destruction at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, otherwise known as Nabucco. And uh, the story of the opera is, is basically about how he was punished by God for his, his hubris, and he comes to his senses and the people of Israel are released. At the age of 14, I was, like many people of my background, I was pretty much an atheist. Um, I was certainly fascinated by nationalism, and that's been a key theme in my anthropology, but also very puzzled by it in some ways. And I discovered later that Verdi was a, a very unconventional, but very passionate Italian nationalist. So that al already begins to start to create explanations. And as I sat in the opera theater of the, of the, of the Teatro Comunale in Florence, and listen to those crashing chords at the beginning of the prelude, of the overture, I remember thinking, this is amazing music. But then a bit later, this music is so beautiful, but if it comes to an end, if the overture comes to an end, then the whole opera will come to an end. And if the opera comes to an end, life itself will come to an end. That was my first total face-to-face -face encounter with mortality. It was, in some sense, I suppose, a religious experience, but a very unconventional one. Then the singing began. And again, it was so glorious, I didn't have any way to describe it. I only know that a year later, when my mother asked me what I would like to have for my next birthday, I said, find me a recording of Nabucco. It wasn't with the same cast, but I became rather obsessed with the voice of Bastianini. And lo and behold, in 1984, I was with my wife in the um, local store of the Ricordi company. Ricordi was Verdi's original publisher. And I was looking through the, the gramophone records and I suddenly went as if I'd seen a ghost shot back from the wall with a kind of intake of breath loud enough for my wife to be quite concerned and coming running over and seeing what was wrong. And I had seen a ghost because there was a yellow box which said Giuseppe Verdi, Nabucco, Ettore Bastianini. I started reading down, same cast, same conductor, not the same night, but same theater. And I had kept, when I moved to America, I had kept that program, and that was the only program I kept, which gives you some sense of its significance in my life. So as the, we, we got back to the States, and I, my wife, a very wise woman, she got as far away from me as possible when I put it on the gramophone. I put it on full <laughs> blast, of course. The minute I heard that music, I could see the theater again and burst into tears. And as the days and weeks and months went by, I began to realize that that was actually when I became an anthropologist. And I'll try to connect that in a moment. I now want to write a book, which I think I'll just call Nabucco. I hope nobody thinks I'm writing about pipelines in the Caucasus, which <laughs> seems to be the latest use of that name. Um, I want to use it, not, in a, I hope, in a self-indulgent way, but to say one's personal experience the way in which one comes to deal with the condition of being human has a tremendous influence on what one thinks is important in anthropology and on what gets represented in our writings. And just a couple of days ago, I had the privilege of having a conversation with the chaplain of this august college, Richard Lloyd Morgan, who very generously agreed to be interviewed, and I was able to record the interview, um, as he talked about the time he had performed in the title role of Nabucco. And it was an extraordinarily moving encounter because he was able to tell me how his family had also factored into his experience. His mother was part French and part of her family was caught in Nazi-occupied France. And when she finally saw him performing that role, as he said, mother wept. I've never heard two words that could move me so deeply as what he said to me at the, on that occasion. And so I have a feeling that this opera is still hovering over everything else I write, and that it would be dishonest to my craft as a writer and as an anthropologist not to engage with that. Well, it so happens, as many of you know, that one of the places where I do field work is Italy, and specifically Rome, and I was dealing with something that I found extremely painful. 
although I've had a glorious year, it was 99, 2000 was the year of the Jubilee, and I was looking rather cynically at the way that the religious authorities were manipulating uh, that event. But I was interested, as I have been for many years, in the impact of historic conservation on the lives of people who live in zones that have been declared historic. And what was happening in the center of the Centro Storico of Rome was, in a word, disgusting. Large money was pushing out an entire social class that couldn't afford anymore uh, to, uh, to live there. Now, there are all sorts of dimensions to something like this, and in my ethnography I do the classic thing of trying to connect it with money lending practices, even a bit of kinship here and there, have to have a bit of kinship, otherwise there's an anthropology, um, and uh, social relations at many different levels, and also looking at the influence of the underworld, both the organized underworld that was partly driving this sudden speculative uh, flurry, and the local underworld that was actually being pushed out by it. And then I started to write, and I could not write without tears. So I'm going to read you now what I wrote at the time of the most intense emotion, because I think that it helps to make the point that this does not undermine factuality. It makes factuality somewhat dependent on positionality, and vice versa. So let me read you just a relatively short passage from, in fact, my most recent book, but I think it illustrates very well what I'm saying. The situation is a tragedy, not because of change. Rome has never been a static city and since ancient times has often absorbed varied cultural influences, but because the displaced family is bewildered and disoriented, easily fall prey to racist and neo-fascist social demagogues and see their familiar places restructured, in quotes, to make way for people who usually have little interest in the spaces of collective memory. With the pattern of eviction, the old economy also collapses. As one man, a printer, pointed out, the forestieri, the outsiders who are now buying up the restructured residences, ignore the local shops. And he said, but here they don't spend anything, they just come here to sleep. The rents they pay, he added, have pushed the overall level far beyond the means of most workers and merchants, and the money goes mostly to absentee landlords. It is a tragedy because it erases all alternatives to the neoliberal vision of the good life. It is a tragedy because its prime movers prefer to keep decent housing vacant rather than allow existing residents to remain at affordable rates, perhaps hoping that isolation and physical neglect will finally drive this riffraff away for good, especially as building decay constitutes a legal reason for refusing to extend a rental contract under the 1998 law, and because in the same process proprietors shut down artisans' workplaces in the expectation that their patients may be rewarded when high-end restaurants and boutiques replace the artisans at vastly inflated rents. And I'm going to miss a, a passage which talks more specifically about some examples of that. All this, I say, is a tragedy too, because it happens with the complacence of left-wing authorities who've surrendered to the allure of neoliberal market logic in virtually every aspect of city management, thereby handing an easy victory to the so-called social right that had itself evicted many thousands of citizens during its heyday under Mussolini. It is a tragedy because it builds on the practices of a church that preaches generosity, the avoidance of unnecessary luxury, and tolerance for those whose circumstances are different, but practices none of these things, despite the indisputable goodwill of individual members of its sometimes genuinely dedicated clergy. Another view I heard expressed held that the church was active in charitable works and parish organizations because this gave it a capillary presence at the community level, and thus also a reservoir of votes. And it is a tragedy because in the eternal city, the bureaucratic denial of any relevance or dignity to the personal sufferings of decent women and men takes on a global resonance that cannot but have far-reaching effects in time and space. It did not escape my friend's notice that at the very moment when in the jubilee year of 2000 the Pope was calling on Romans to take the poor and needy into their homes, churches and confraternities throughout the city were evicting long-term residents. Secular owners, too, evicted residents to make quick money from the wealthier pilgrims 
expected to flood in that year, as happened in one stretch of Via del Boschetto, right in the heart of Monti. That's the area where I was working. The city authorities wrung their hands, but beyond a few symbolic gestures, failed to intervene. Perhaps some readers, perhaps all of you, will notice that my words have taken on something of the tone and rhetorical cadences of an Italian political speech. The last few paragraphs could easily be rendered in Italian with the rough lilt of Roman diction. That is not coincidental. I write with all the anger of identification, and it would be disingenuous to deny it. The struggle against eviction is a struggle against vastly stronger economic power, and even those whose ideological leanings might predispose them to sympathize often just shrug their shoulders as if accepting as irresistible the implacable march of the market. Now, at the risk, I'm sure there are some who would feel that it's overwritten, it's a little bit histrionic, but my point in making you, the listener, you, the reader, conscious of how I understand my own voice is to say this is, in fact, a political moment in which I am physically and in, in an embodied <coughs> way deeply captured, I'm involved. There is no way that I could be in this situation without being moved in quite a literal sense of that word. That is, it's a physical response. I sometimes would go home and just weep with frustration. The same thing happened to me when I found myself working not that much later with a community in the heart of Bangkok. And those of you who came to my work in progress seven hours last year remember me talking about that community. I'm going to say something about it today from a different angle. This is a very poor community. It has <coughs> tried to create certain compromises with the dominant ideology as a way of surviving and has resisted the power of the municipality of Bangkok for over 21 years, uh, successfully so far, but always under threat. And again, I would find myself feeling angry on their behalf. Not everybody in the community is an angel, any more than they are, certainly in Rome. But surely it is precisely the flawed condition of humanity that makes us love our fellow humans. And I see nothing exaggerated or inappropriate in talking about that kind of emotion uh, when you're dealing uh, with, uh, with ethnography. Because ethnography itself, to be successful, must in some sense be an act of passion. Not always of love, but an act of passion. There has to be some way of connecting with the people you're describing. Not all of my writing, as many of you know, is as directly concerned with these emotions. But I chose to focus on that today um, because, as you'll see in a moment, I'm also trying to think about how one moves from one genre to another. So let me just first very briefly give you another um, section of something that's not yet published and which I actually should have tried to finish while I was here, but of course, you know, like they say, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions and the road to publication <coughs> is certainly paved with many traps. Um, this is a section that I've currently headed Embodied Ambiguities, and I'm talking about the fact that I developed a strangely affectionate relationship with this very tough, now middle-aged man. He was younger when I met him, of course, had been going on for over 10 years, um, but who is the president of this community and very much their leader, and a very forceful individual who, in his personal mien, combines the two extremes that I think are always in oscillation in Thai politics. That is, he's constantly exhorting his, his people to fight back, and he's quite aggressive about it, but he's also making sure that there's a space for them to express themselves. I don't know how you would feel if somebody suddenly yelled at you, you've got to speak out and not be afraid of arguing with me, right? <laughs> but in fact, um, that's the only way he can fight against the strong tradition that still obtains in Thailand, whereby some people simply define themselves as followers. He wanted to make sure everyone had a voice. And he, on the surface, did not look like somebody who would show much emotion. Even, or perhaps especially when a friendship is close, is close, the teasing that ambiguity makes possible is never far away. Conversely, however, formality can convey an equally striking intensity of affect. That's why I'm wearing a necktie, of course. 
Um, the community president, for example, greets me with an affection that has grown dramatically deeper over the years, but the affection is often couched in terms of almost repressive courtesy. He addresses me formally as Tanajan, honored professor, and his way, the gesture with the palms pressed together, is respectful, if not as deep as the one he reserves for the elderly retired palace policeman whose collections of clocks, stamps, postcards, and assorted memorabilia and documents have made that gentleman a valuable resource for establishing historical details about the community, and himself grew up there, the last, perhaps, of the royal bureaucrats whose homes had constituted the original settlement. By indexing this living link to the royal past, the president, by acting with exquisite attention to protocol, reminds all present that Pom Mahakan has a distinguished history. With me, something else is at stake. Now, I'm going to break here simply to point out, I'm using myself as a comparandum, and I think that's really the, the reason for being specific about, about one's positionality. It's not that I'm interesting in myself. If I were, I wouldn't have to write about anyone else. It's because I'm different from the people I studied, and yet there is that common humanity. I'm trying to figure out what that difference signifies. That something emerges in moments of intense emotion. When the president has not seen me for several months, for example, he does what he could not easily do with a Thai professor. He embraces me with a huge and lingering hug, as though he needs to be reassured of my physical presence as an earnest of my ongoing involvement in the community's affairs. Very early in our acquaintance, he asked me what I would do if the community were eventually to be evicted. Would I stay in touch? For all his air of self-assurance, presiding over a delegitimized community bespeaks a precarious future by any measure. My response seemed to reassure him that my interest in historical memory made it imperative for me to try to maintain contact with the community after dispersal as much as if it proved able to stay. He may then also proffer a respectful why, but he will also sometimes jokingly refer to me as my uncle, the English words being a clear indication that our relationship is not strictly grounded in Thai protocol. <laughs> Even this is ambiguous. Lung, patril patrilateral uncle, is an honorific prefix and term of address for a respected senior member of the community. The president never uses the Thai kinship term for me, however, so that his choice of the English term marks the conceptual space in which he's free to make the equally untied gesture of hugging me, something he would otherwise only do to a very close family member or long-term intimate. In this way, he negotiates the balance between showing his co-residents and outsiders that he's respectful of the foreign professor, while also showing me directly and without any sign that he's doing anything unusual an affection that has matured in the activist efforts we've pursued together. His use of the formal address mode simultaneously indexes what is supposed to be a thoroughly Thai idiom of hierarchy, placing me in a position where I have no choice uh, to adopt the same code, but to adopt the same code of formal courtesy, and thus rendering me a prisoner of my own assumed status. But the fact that his mode is used with the foreigner also hints at the historically crypto-colonial conditions, and we'll come to crypto-colonialism too, that have both sustained and arguably partially originated the current styles of hierarchy in the first place. Now, I could go on at great length, but um, I don't want to bore you by reading too much from text. I simply use this example to say, perhaps more clearly than in the previous one, that in talking about this very emotional friendship, uh, and I talk about other emotional dimensions of it at other points in the text, I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. I'm trying to draw attention to the fact that people can communicate across cultural lines. This is, in a sense, almost an anti-Warfian position. It's saying we can, uh, we can communicate effectively precisely because we do learn each other's codes. And here is a story of this man learning my code, and I think rather effectively. Now, I said I would say something about crypto-colonialism, and the reason I want to do that is because I'm also working on a book on that topic. I was going to, at least, going to try to draft the book while I was here. Again, that was one of those frustrated desires. I managed to do something much more useful. I had a lot of very good conversations with many people, many of whom are in this room right now, about whether it would actually be a useful concept. And as we talked, 
it became clearer and clearer to me that what I had to insist on most of all was the destructible nature of the concept. In other words, rather than trying to set up a new classification, which anthropologists in the past have sometimes been much too fond of doing, what I'm actually doing is saying there is a kind of colonialism that is different because it operates through soft power. No example of it is absolutely 100% perfect. And there are some examples, China and Japan, for example, that don't fit the model very well at all. So that in the end, the value of the model will be a little bit like the value of a translation. In the words of one of my teachers in my public school here in England, um, uh, Philip Velikot, who was a well-known translator of ancient Greek tragedies, and who in his introduction to the back, he said, the purpose of a translation from the Greek is achieved when the reader throws the, or hurls the translation into the fire and starts to learn the language for himself. In the same way, I do not want crypto-colonialism to become a sort of mantra. I'd like to see it got rid of, but I'd like to see that it might have left behind it uh, what the late Rodney Needham would have called an iridescent morphosis, but I don't aspire to quite such luminous, luminous um, <laughs> uh, uh, avatars. Um, in any case, the point at issue for me here um, in talking about crypto-colonialism is precisely that um, here I have to think much more, I don't want to say rationally, but much more scientifically in the sense that my ideas about crypto-colonialism, my ideas about the manipulation of hierarchy, have come at me, as they do to most anthropologists, from the small end of the telescope. In other words, I've seen the processes that I associate with crypto-colonialism, the absorption of Western ways subtly turned in some occasions against the West, but certainly used to establish a particular kind of hierarchy, even the Bomahakan president's use of English words, for example, that th this has to be described in a very different tone of voice. You can't write an emotional account that is comparative in a formal sense. And since in the space of what I hope and pray will be a short book, I want to talk about Greece and Thailand, Nepal and Bhutan, Iran and Afghanistan, Ethiopia, uh, China and Japan, and Iceland, a very important <laughs> example, um, I have to find a way of doing it. Now, at this point, one might say, write big history the way historians do, and obviously to some extent that's what I'll have to do. But I'm going to write it as an anthropologist as well. What's my ethnography? My ethnography is the conversations I have with you and with many other people. I will talk, as I plan to talk in the Nabucco book about my conversation with the chaplain, I will talk in the crypto-colonialism book about the extraordinary moment in a conference that I attended uh, a couple of months ago in Iceland where the discussion was all about whether, the first day was all about whether Iceland was a crypto colony. And one rather conservative Icelandic historian, who I think probably hadn't quite understood the concept at that point, suddenly er erupted and said, but Iceland never was a colony. Well, if you read any history of Iceland, of course, it talks about how Iceland was first a colony of Norway and then of Denmark. So why, what did he mean? Well, the answer was obvious because everybody started to laugh, simply because I had said that in Thailand, a country that has been forced in many ways to adopt certain kinds of Western conventions, but then has played creatively with them, people say we were never under colonialism. And all of these countries do share some things in common. They, for one thing, they share varying degrees of exclusion from what I call the crypto-colonial gremlin club. When I mention that, especially when I use that expression, it usually gets a laugh, which means that there is something that people recognize. And I think that that's prima facie evidence as well for certain kinds of attitudes. So um, in writing the crypto-colonialism book, I'm going to have to be a lot more restrained about telling you what I feel like, but I don't think it's actually all that relevant. And if people want to see how I got from working with a bunch of sheep thieves on a Cretan mountain, working with a bunch of, of um, evictees or potential evictees in the heart of Bangkok, to this broad theoretical uh, or a, um, a model, uh, I suspect that they will, in fact, have to go back to the ethnographies and see exactly what 
I'm referring to. And then they can, if they enjoy it, they can wallow in my more purple prose as much as they want. I think we all make choices like that. I mean, most, many of the people in this room have written books that were more theoretical and less theoretical for various reasons. Um, but I feel that we now stand at a very difficult moment for anthropology, but a moment of tremendous potential, and that's why the question of how we write suddenly takes on a political significance it arguably has never had before in the history of the discipline. And that is because while some people would like to claim that there was no such thing as neoliberalism, and it's all a lot of different things under a common name, and so on and so forth, it is very clear that some social scientists, and almost all managers of any kind, including many bureaucrats in universities, and I could name a few in my own, um, <coughs> understand their task as being to eliminate the humane relationships that make life worth living. They don't do it because they want to make us suffer, they do it because they want to extract profit. This is the, the time of capitalism gone mad. All you have to do is to look at what's happening in Greece today, uh, where the blame game, which of course the Greeks were past masters, always blaming someone else, for once I think they're playing it quite justifiably in many respects, to see that real suffering is associated with pernicious ideologies of this kind. And even if these ideologies are not identical from case to case, there is a coincidence, a convergence, if you will, in the world in which we now live among points of view that are absolutely repressive <coughs> of the relevance of detail to uh, the way the world is managed. In Denmark, it is no longer possible for a professor to remain a professor if he wants to become head of department. He becomes a manager instead and actually applies for a different position that is rather better paid than being a professor. Then, as a head of department, he or she has the right to say, you haven't been teaching as many students, therefore you have to teach an extra course. As if somehow university education could be packaged like so much corned beef that it's a grocery approach to learning. We have to fight it. And I believe that anthropology, social anthropology, is the only discipline that has purged itself quite cruelly during that period of high postmodernism in a way that actually positions it very well to make that argument. We have to be able to convey to a skeptical public that what we focus on, especially these tiny details of a uh, little bit of language use or um, the composition uh, of, a, of a, a dish or uh, indeed our old favorite, uh, the terminology associated with kinship, neighborhood and other kinds of social relations, that all of these things come together to create a portrait that would be wiped out by the dominance of what one can think of, a little cruelly perhaps, but not unjustifiably, as the number crunching disciplines. Now, I'm not against statistics, but you know that there are lies, damn lies in statistics. And when statistics are used in the wrong way, they can be very dangerous. I'm going to give you, and in fact I'll finish with this, an example that has to do with what I call the concept of meerness. And I'm not talking about mere cats. Um, <laughs> But I am talking about um, the, the way in which those who have power use it to poo-poo things that we think are important. And very commonly, it takes the form of anthropologists don't really deal with reality because whereas, for example, an archaeologist can excavate and find real things, anthropologists' ideas are all up in the air and have nothing to do with reality. I don't think anyone in this room probably would endorse that perspective, but it's amazing how effective it is in influencing the way that universities allocate funding resources. And that is the thin end of an extraordinary long and thick, thick wedge. I also think that the general public needs to be educated in what social anthropology is. I had a terrible fight once with the head of a very distinguished foundation when I said that, because she thought quite wrongly that I meant 
that we should simply teach the public to use our pompous postmodern terminology. No. But we do use some words for technical reasons. We have just as much of a technical tool toolkit as any other scholarly discipline. And we need to be able to explain why the concepts that lie behind those terms are actually important. People who do econometrics are particularly egregious. They will tell you quite calmly that they're not interested in people, they're interested in models. Now, I'm sure some of them in their everyday lives don't take that position. But they don't seem to understand that there are various kinds of statistical concerns, even in the way we work. Max Gluckman famously, in 1963, argued that anthropology should recollect its origin as a word in the Greek word anthropologos, used in Aristophanes to mean a scandalmonger, and that actually gossip was a very large part of what we do as anthropologists. If you say anthropology is the academic study of gossip, people laugh. And when they laugh, and this is where we have to develop new techniques, you have to say, why did you just laugh? Why did you just laugh? In the same way as, for example, when I say to a room full of, of students um, that uh, uh, in Greece people argued that we shouldn't be accusing the Greeks of paranoia, for example, because that was a Greek word and they know what it means and we don't, and people laugh. There is a case of crypto-colonialism. In other words, they've been forced to use the idea of the antiquity of our vocabulary to get their own legitimacy in terms defined by them. So we need to be more attentive, not just the way we write, but to the way that we immediately interact with audience reactions. And call the bluff of people who use the word mere. Mereness is an accusation. And when people say that's mere gossip, the answer is how much time do most people spend gossiping? It's actually a surprisingly large amount of their waking lives. Now, we find that funny, but the fact of the matter is that the information we get from gossip is statistically as compelling as counting up the number of sheep they slaughter in a given year. And in fact, uh, we could say, I think very confidently, that it is only when you listen to the gossip that you come up with some sort of corrective that will work against survey methods that while we're told they are primed to avoid being captured by lies, actually I think often do rest a great deal on dishonest responses. I wonder how many people in this room could honestly say that they've always given a totally honest response to survey takers. And I see some embarrassed grins around the room, which makes me very happy, because those embarrassed grins are the signs of what I call cultural intimacy. In this case, the cultural intimacy of our discipline, not now as anthropologists, but more generally as academics. We know that there's a lot of fudging. And the more honest econometric people actually admit that. And some of them are very good at acknowledging that. By and large, they don't want to know. By and large, they don't want to know what we do because it's not relevant to model building. What kind of a social science can actually say, we're not interested in people, we're interested in building models? To me, that is a cultural fact that needs addressing. And I believe that although it would be pretentious to think that I or anyone else for that matter could achieve this revolution that I'm imagining on the basis of some ethnographies. Why can't we try to persuade the general public to read ethnographies with the sort of enjoyment they would read, say, a nice thriller? Some ethnographies can be read that way. The publishing industry nearly went under in the sense of refusing to publish many more ethnographies. Now they're coming back. So there's hope, because people are actually finding ethnographies interesting to read. But it is precisely the gossip, if you will, the talk, the everydayness of interaction that we not only need to rescue from oblivion, we do that when we write a book, we need to tell people this is where you will find a great deal of information that will not necessarily give the lie to everything that the more number crunching disciplines parade. Um, they're not always wrong, and I'm not prepared to take an extremist position on that. But it will at least make people aware that when somebody tells you that's mere gossip, that's mere hearsay, 
you invent the facts because you can't put them down in a numerical form, you can't tabulate them, and so on and so forth. Those kinds of responses are a cultural product that are just as analyzable by the means of anthropology as anything we study in a remote mountain village or tribal group. So I'd like to conclude by saying that the two months I've spent here in the company of many non-anthropologists as well as anthropologists have been extraordinarily enriching for me in thinking, why did that 14-year-old boy who was so moved by Nabucco end up feeling that this relatively obscure discipline, which after all often gets the reaction, anthropopo what, um, actually can make a difference. I think the reason is that we are poised at a particular moment when a lot of the public is actually dissatisfied with what it is being told by the managerial classes, and it is dissatisfied especially, I'll give you an example, when, for example, a German economist writes in a Greek newspaper, I assume it was translated, that of course the Greek people have to accept more belt tightening before they can come out of the mess, and this is the only way that Greece will be economically sound. Well, who is going to be economically sound? There's a book that's about to appear written by an American anthropologist by the name of Douglas Holmes, some of you probably know his book, Integral Europe, um, in which he argues that the bank economists, especially of the Central Bank of Europe and other associated institutions, actually provide the material out of which they then offer predictions in such a way that people start to pick them up as fact. That's gossip too, and it's a rather dangerous form of gossip, and we can study it. Now that we've accepted that anthropologists can study everyone, I used to joke that, anthropo that, that a good definition of power was the capacity to keep anthropologists out. <laughs> um, but now that in fact we do feel that we can study any group of people, we can certainly do that we can talk about the bankers, we can talk about the economists, we can talk about what the anthropologists are doing. They shouldn't be immune to this either. But I think that we also have to make a concerted effort to say that whether or not in the end it's called anthropology or something else, again, I'm not witted to terms, a discipline that yokes the analysis of very minute detail from people's lives with an understanding of its emotional significance and impact has something to offer a jaded and cynical world. I'm a great deal less jaded and cynical than I was two months ago, and I think <laughs> the encouragement that I've had here has a great deal to do with that. Energize to take this fight forward and hope that many of you will feel moved to do the same. Thank you very much. And in case you're worried, I turned, I turned the recording off. I don't know if anyone has any objections. It would actually be useful to, well, you, you're recording anyway, so all right, we'll go on. <laughs> so, please. Yes. Well done. And please speak up because the room is a little bit. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the process, actually, the um, process of your field work. Uh, you, you've revealed how involved you are with the communi community that you work with. I wonder how you discern um, how involved to be and whether <coughs> um, at times you should create or maintain some kind of distance from, from, from the people, the community that you, work, the community that you work with. Um, have there been moments perhaps uh, where you, you know, wish that maybe there was um, some, some sort of distance or whether <coughs> you, you, you could there be more involved? Moments. Yeah, there have been moments when I've been quite alienated, actually, um, and so I would describe those as well. I do not think that one uh, should do a whitewash job. What we should be doing is saying these people are human, but in the end that makes it much more powerful. Um, there's another part to your question, um, and it may not be what you intended, but I have had the experience of people say, saying, well, you're so involved with this community, how can you be objective? Well, leaving aside the notion that that kind of objectivity is a very parochial because Western Cartesian model um, that doesn't take into account the very different philosophical background of the people I'm studying in this case, I would have to say that if I restricted myself to the kinds of data they considered legitimate, I would have much less information. So I usually answer that by saying, 
do you mean that fewer data means more objectivity? Um, I, that's not necessarily what, what you were talking about, but I think it's related. Um, most importantly, I think that there are moments when I felt, for example, that the president's community was overreaching himself. Uh, I have felt that there were bad mistakes made tactically by the people. In fact, part of my book on Rome is about why they couldn't resist very effectively, and it shows things that they probably feel a bit embarrassed about. Um, so it's not that I want to heroize these people, I want to humanize them. And the thing is, they're being dehumanized by the forces that are trying to push them out. I was just wondering about, um, when you were talking about the difference between the kind of number crunching statistical papers and anthropological writing, because I think uh, one of the great values of statistical stuff is that obviously they don't show all of the negative results, but at least there's some degree um, at some degree is shown of how the model that they're trying to prove fits the data that they actually have. Whereas in anthropological writing, you don't get any negative results at all. It's basically, it's, it's a narrative that where you get only the positive results that fit the particular interpretation of the anthropologist. And so do you think there's a way of anthropological writing that shows more kind of negative results, like shows more of kind of a discrepancy between the data that's gathered by the anthropologist and the I would have to disagree the with your characterization of anthropological writing, first of all. I think that um, you do find uh, explanatory attempts, but they're explanatory attempts that um, seek to find the right level of explanation and reject the idea that you can use some vast model that it's predictive for enormous populations to understand what's happening in a community where, a small community where indeterminacy may be a much greater factor. So that's the first thing. Um, second, yes, we write, and that was part of, of course, of the burden of what I was saying. We do write books that are not strictly um, descriptive or ethnographic. And uh, when I write this crypto colonial book, for example, I'm going to be making some theoretical claims. You know, what kind of, of society um, can be so characterized, how, does, how do these societies differ from post-colonial societies, um, how can we identify them. But as I said, I think it's also important to recognize that that model is inherently unstable. And like any classificatory system, it is the greatest source of knowledge at the moment at which it disintegrates. So the goal is actually to push it as far as it will go and then send it tumbling into the dust and hopefully leaving behind it some sense of, of, of greater understanding. I think one of the problems, not of economics and political science, so much as the way the public reads economics and political science and some forms of sociology, is that the public has learned to assume that the end goal is a theory. To me, the end goal is deeper knowledge and deeper knowledge only occurs when theory itself weakens. Because if you, otherwise a theory becomes a thing in itself, it becomes, it becomes uh, the end point, and at that moment you would probably say there's no point in investigating anything further. Now I don't mean by that that the only goal of anthropology is to find more and more and more data. That would be also fairly pointless. But as we write different kinds of ethnographies and think about how they fit the different needs of every age and every country in which they're written, because the other thing is that there are different traditions of writing anthropology, um, we increase our sensitivity to cultural difference, including cultural difference in the production of academic discourses. And so in my view, that allows us uh, to be theoretically more astute uh, when we, uh, on the other hand, try to come up with generalizations, Radcliffe Brown was a great one for that. He wanted to produce laws of human society. Those laws had no capacity for recognizing what in fact we all know from our everyday experience, which is that the things people do are not always completely predictable. In fact, they're often not predictable at all. So it seems to me that um, reading an ethnography should well, let me backtrack a moment and say writing an ethnography should allow the reader to see what your theoretical assumptions are and where your doubts about them lie. But you should give the reader enough material that the reader can then wrestle with your theoretical framework and say, but you know, you could interpret all of this in a different way. It's the disagreement and the difference that will then produce, I think, a much more profound form of knowledge. What do you, what do you think is the is a way to reconcile the project of... Um, I'm sorry, can you speak a bit louder? Sure. Uh, what do you think is... Uh, how, how can the project of um, 
getting personally and emotionally involved with the people you study be reconciled with the study of elites? What if you were to study real estate investors, for example, and got involved in their lives and hopes and fears? Well, I did actually talk to some realtors um, in the real world, and I found one of them extraordinarily charming. In fact, she's become a very good friend of ours, and I found the one who said, but we're improving the neighborhood to be rather repulsive. Uh, predictably so, I, I, I think you would agree. Um, I think that I would be loath to focus on that profession, but I am planning a, an ethnographic study of Italian town planners. And they're not always the most sympathetic characters. Some are very, very nice and very accessible. But I want to try to understand what sort of problems in their professional lives make it difficult for them to imagine the consequences of their designs for the people who have to live in what they design. So um, I think that it's perfectly possible to do this and one of the consequences of the postmodern convulsions of the 80s and 90s was precisely that contrary to predictions of the demise of, of ethnography, we actually now live in an era where we can do many more, we can use many different different kinds of sites. Um, we've also moved off the um, idea that you have to be in a particular location. I've tended to stay with that because it suits my style of research, but I've also gone off site a lot. If you study a profession, you'll be studying a network. To me, the mark, the hallmark of good ethnography is when the reader sees that there's information here that could not have been obtained by any kind of survey method, however thorough, that it requires the achievement of personal intimacy. So if you're going to study realtors or speculators, you've got to become very intimate with them. Douglas Holmes managed to do that not only with these uh, uh, bankers, about whom he's quite critical, but he does describe their position in a very empathic kind of way. But in his previous book, he did something which I think was even riskier and pulled it off in Integral Europe. He talks about these far-right parliamentarians in the European Parliament, and he points out that you know, they have very real arguments, very interesting arguments. In fact, it's their intelligence and humanity that makes their ideology so frightening. But that's for the reader to deduce. Now, you might, you know, somebody here might be of that ideological persuasion and say, well, at least somebody's finally re recognized, you know, we're not a bunch of, of, of idiotic Nazis or something. Um, but the point is that, that um, we choose our subjects very much, I think, in terms of what we're interested in, the kind of people we're interested in, sometimes the kind of political systems we're interested in, and people have very variable relationships with their communities. I would say that most of the ethnography that is really successful does achieve some level of empathy. I'll just give you one very simple example of my own experience. I was working with these shepherds in the mountains of Crete who had ideas about gender that I found utterly repulsive. And not only I, but also my wife, found these people utterly charming. And it's thinking about that, that the humanity in, in a situation where you feel alienated. When the chaplain of Kings, when he was singing Nabucco, moved his mother to tears, it was because he was portraying Nabucco as essentially a power-crazed European dictator or a cross between a European and African dictator was somehow they were trying to generalize it. And I think that that, uh, again, you know, his, his encounter with the music, as he put it to me, you strip everything down in a way that, that leaves you just with the music and nothing else. I try to do that in the ethnography. Um, and if I were to write about um, the real estate profession, I would try to portray these people as the human beings they are. Otherwise, I think it's bad ethnography. But it's, you know, it's harder to do that. I knew one anthropologist, I don't know what happened to him in the end, but he was um, openly gay and he went to see, to, he tried to get into one of these militias in Montana that are specifically you know, homophobic. And they were delighted and welcomed him as a visitor and guaranteed his safety. And he did get a lot of very interesting data that I do know, precisely because he said, all right, I disagree with you, you hate what I stand for, but I want to know what makes you tick. And I think that's the strength of anthropology. It's the reaching out 
to understand the substance of humanity, even in those who might deny ours. Do we have time for one more? I don't know what's going on behind me. This reminds me of the days when I was interviewed yes. for my time in um, at Peterhouse, <laughs> where I was interviewed by one person who was actually behind me. Yes, go Thank you very much. And uh, I really enjoyed the talk, and I, was, I wish that I could have time to uh, have the experience of listening to the opera when I was 14, but unfortunately I don't have the chance. So probably that's why I find it very hard for me to understand what you mean by compassion and what does it uh, different from other, like, discipline in the humanity, uh, social science. Um, basically, what is the difference between like, and the, the compassion you are mentioning in the, in the, the process of writing <coughs> and uh, differ from that other disciplines uh, mm -hmm. such as sociology or psychology? And the other question is about um, rather very, I was very confused uh, um, when you are doing the field work. I mean, you can not possibly love anyone in the field you studied, you must have this emotional moment of hatred and love. So when that moment comes, how do you connect yourself to the people and how do you see yourself as a humanist in that kind of a moment? I'll take the second question first because it's actually the easier question, I think, which is that we all know that the divining line between hatred and love is sometimes <coughs> not all that long, not that wide. That, you know, we're talking about deep passion, deep feelings, and I mean the Greeks actually express it by saying that if you're closely related, your blood will boil more, and so it will either boil up and make you hug each other with deep affection, or will actually lead you to fratricide. Um, and I think m in many cultures that intensity is recognized. Um, so that actually relates to the answer to your first question because um, compassion is something I think that you come to after you have wrestled with your feelings of dislike or indeed hatred. I don't think I've ever hated anyone in the field, but I certainly dislike quite a few people and I try to be honest about that as well. Um, but in many ways, I think people whom one ends up disliking intensely, uh, one also understands, have their own reasons, have their own world. And the real challenge for the anthropologist is indeed to try to understand that. That's why, you know, I really wanted to praise.